how much house can you afford and how does it all work if you make around $80,000 a year in commission and you have around 3 to 10% available for a down payment. This video will provide detailed answers for someone in that situation or a similar one because we know that when you start looking into buying a house and you start looking up what your options are, you probably start with a quick Google search and the results raise new questions. So you might try a mortgage calculator, but that only makes things more confusing. So you try a YouTube video, but nothing addresses all the specifics of your unique situation. So you start wishing you could just talk to someone who had all the answers and who knew the specifics of your income amount, your income type, your credit score, how much you have saved up, and so on. But you probably feel like it's too early to talk to a lender yourself and you just want to do some initial research, but you still want to get personalized helpful answers that aren't that confusing. So you can ultimately figure out what you could qualify for and what a monthly payment might be. So what we're trying to do in this video is replicate your situation with a staged phone call between someone in your situation and a mortgage advisor who can give you all the answers. My dad's a mortgage advisor, so I'm going to hop on a call with him. The numbers won't be exactly the same as yours, but hopefully the situation will be similar enough so that you can substitute yours in and get a good idea of what to expect. If you want to hop on a phone call yourself to get personalized answers, go to the link in the description below. Thank you for calling. This is Chris. Hey, Chris. I'm looking into buying a house near Seattle, something probably in the $700,000 range, but I need your help to figure out if it's possible. I'm in insurance sales, so it's been a little bit confusing figuring out what I would qualify for. So I was wondering if you could help me figure out what my monthly payment would be and what I can afford. So so let me, let me start by just gathering kind of some basic information about you that will help inform you know, my recommendations, my conversation with you. So you, you mentioned, for example, you're in sales. Um, are you, do you get a 1099, do you get a W-2, or are you mostly commissioned, do you get a salary, and how long have you been doing this? I'm W-2, so I've been at this company specifically about a year and a half, since last January. It's April, and uh, it's been about a year and a half so since last January. I don't know if you need what I was doing before that, but um, just to give you a little bit of context, I was in marketing for uh, kind of a big clothing company and I was salaried then. And then I came on here last January and that was 2022. And so my W-2 for that was 75,000. Um, but uh, this year I'm, I'm expecting to make a little bit more than that, not a ton, probably around 80 this year. Um, I don't know, some of that was base and some of that was, was commission. So I don't know if you need the breakdown of that. Yeah, that's, that's kind of the first area where we have to, to, to take a look at this because that's where you know, perhaps one of your biggest challenges is going to be um, because you're, you're in a variable income position for less than two years. And the standard guideline is if you're, uh, depending upon variable income, both Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac generally like to see a two-year history of earning that. They need to qualify you as based upon stable what they call stabilized income. Generally, you want to try and get into Fannie and Freddie's box because then you're having subsidized borrowing. You're, you're borrowing mm -hmm. um, from these entities that themselves are benefited by the federal government's guarantee so they can borrow less expensively and they can lend to us less expensively. And, and so that's why they set the tone for the market. They determine who qualifies, what the requirements are, and they determine you know, what what sort of history I need in commission sales in order to, be able oh, okay. to rely upon that commission sales income. Uh, and in your case, you know, the, generally it's, it, it's not you know they, they allow for as little as twelve months, which you do have, and you know every month you're adding to that, and and so it's possible that you can get approved and qualified using some commission income for less than twenty four months, but it is discretionary and it requires. You know, what they call some sort of compensating factors where they need to be able to look at your situation and see, oh, I see where this 15-month history is more than adequate to justify us using whatever that number is. But generally speaking, you, sh you shouldn't depend upon that. You shouldn't presume upon that getting that exception because it's hard. You know, okay. the, the times you might get that exception is if you've done something very, very similar in another place. And, okay. and, and now you've just transitioned to a different company and you're doing, you know, that's kind of the obvious example. If you were doing commission sales for, you know, uh, Geico, and then you went over to Farmers and you're still doing commission sales, but you have more than two years history and a lot of that client base is sure. carries over from company, then, then generally you're going to be okay. But, but in your case, you used to do salaried marketing. Now you moved over to a hybrid um, and it's something really, frankly, completely new, right? Selling insurance is not the same thing as marketing clothing. Mm -hmm. And and so yeah. so therefore you know, you're 
you know, we could probably use your salary component without question. I initially said 700000 and I should say that I have no clue where what I could get to. So I don't know. Maybe I still won't. If it's if it's just that base of forty, I'm not sure how much house that will get me. But uh, I guess we can keep keep going and and see what that gets me. But um, if it's not quite quite seven hundred, you know, I have some flexibility there. But we'll see. Yeah, maybe this is just informs you and prepares you to think about it down the road as well. You know, I suspect mm -hmm. that you know at forty thousand, your your qualifying is going to be. Fairly significantly hampered, you know, relative to seven hundred thousand, you'd have to come a long way down. But that's okay. One of the things we haven't really talked about is um, what, what are your, you know, how much down payment do you have? You know, how much cash do you have available to put into this transaction? Because obviously that makes a big difference on how much you can qualify for. Yeah. So I actually have about eighty thousand saved up. Okay. Yeah. No, that's super helpful. You know, if we're talking about a seven hundred thousand dollar purchase, what that tells me is that, that we can probably hit, you know, or target ten percent down. A lot of times, people come and they think, "Oh, you know, I have ten percent down," and what they're really thinking of is seventy thousand all in. You know, that's that's all the cash I have, and they think, "Oh, I'm seven hundred thousand. That's ten percent down." And sometimes they don't realize that the total cash that you need to bring to the table is you know, your down payment, and then it's plus your closing cost, and then prepaid expenses. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask about. What uh, I don't, what are those generally? How much does that end up being? Yeah, and it varies. Um, yeah, it, it it varies for a, a whole number of different reasons. But I, I generally just want people to allow for uh, in this price range. So it's going to vary based upon price range because you know, so things that require your cash, you know, are going to be um, your down payment and then your transaction fees or, or closing costs and then what they call prepaids. Um, and and the first two are fairly intuitive, pretty easy. You know, your down payment is your down payment. If you're going to put ten percent down on seven hundred thousand, that's seventy thousand. That's a really straightforward mm -hmm. number. Um, closing cost your fees. That can be pretty straightforward. Uh, generally, what we're talking about are the cost involved in paying for people who are providing services to get the deal done, products or services to get the deal done. So these are things like title, escrow, appraisal, credit report, etc. You know, those. Those are all cost involved. Now, the reason why it's not completely straightforward is that you can manage what your total costs are by the interest rate you choose. You know, and, that, and that's a little bit a different part of the conversation. On any given day, a, a lender doesn't just have one rate to give you. They'll have a rate what they call you know that they call the par rate, and at that rate, they're they're saying here's the rate that's a going rate for the day based upon what the market's doing out there. And let's say that's six and a half percent. And they're saying you, you have to pay all these other people involved in your transaction for title and escrow, et cetera, but you don't have to pay us extra for the rate. That's now now you may say, well, I actually, you know, I'm gonna be in this loan for a long time and I'm willing to pay up front to get a permanent lower interest rate, because I think over time that's gonna benefit me more. And, mm -hmm. I, and I don't like having this higher interest rate, or maybe I need that lower interest rate mm -hmm. to qualify. And so you you have these base costs for all these fees, services that are involved, title, escrow, appraisal, credit report, etc. But then you have this extra point, fraction of a point, or points that you're paying to buy the rate down. But you can also do the reverse. You can say, look, I, you know, I'm really stretched at 70K, I have maybe 75K all in for this deal, and I want to get to 10% down because I know my interest rate and pricing will probably be a little bit better if I get to 10% down. But I really hmm. don't have that extra, maybe let's say ten grand that it would take to cover all the other things involved. But I'm willing to actually take a higher interest rate to lower those costs. And so yeah. instead of six point five, let's say you take six point seven five, and the lender says, "Okay, if you'll do that, then I will pay four or five thousand dollars towards your closing costs. I will credit you against those closing costs." So, so that's why that's not as straightforward an answer. But okay. Generally, I like my customers just to say, you know, in this price range. You should plan for about ten thousand plus or minus extra okay. cash, and and the other element we didn't really talk about are the prepaid. You know, we mentioned those. Some of that ten thousand dollars, and generally it's about half, is for cost associated with owning property that you have to finance through the loan process. And, and let's say one of the most obvious examples of that is county taxes. You know, when you own a home, you take on the responsibility for paying your property taxes every year. Yeah, and so it's not like extra costs in order to get the loan. Right, it's it's, just... yeah, not a part of the loan cost at all, 
but it is something that um, you know, most people, I'd say most people that I work with, they pay their taxes through their lender. And even if you don't, when you buy a house, for example, you have prorations between you and the seller. So you're almost always funding some level of property taxes through the closing process. And so that can add, you know, almost a half year's worth of county taxes. And if you're, you know, if you're looking at a property, a seven hundred thousand dollar property, and and your county taxes are six thousand dollars a year, that adds three thousand dollars extra cost that you might have to fund through the purchase process. And so, so anyway, all of that to say, you know, I think your numbers are good. When you say you have about eighty k, it's all seasoned, so to speak. You know, you've got some of it inherited, some of it in stocks and savings, but it's all legitimate funds that can be used for the process. And you've got enough to, to you know, in, in your case, I would say, let's target 10% down. You know, if you put 20% down, then you don't have to pay mortgage insurance. But if you put only 15% down, then you're going to pay mortgage insurance, but it's only so much because you're putting 15% down. But then if you only put 14% down, then that cost goes up and maybe that interest rate goes up. So there, hmm. there are different thresholds which are important to cross or meaningful to cross. If you can, in your case, you happen to be right about that 10% threshold. And so that's probably what I would do. And I think, you know, I think what, what would be useful in your case, now if you keep doing what you're doing and keep growing that commission base and establishing that history of earning it, then that should be very accessible. Um, but right now, based upon, you know, $40,000 salary and uh, about 15 months worth of earning commission, 15 or 16 months worth of earning commission, we're probably going to be limited to that forty thousand dollar amount, you know, base okay. salary for qualifying, and that's going yeah. to be very limiting in today's environment. Now, I'm happy. Yeah, you know, what, what I'm what I'm happy to do is I can work up numbers for you, and I can even work up numbers you know, for you at seven hundred thousand. You know, you may go back and you know, who knows, talk to your parents and say, you know, I'm not going to qualify. I've just started this job. I'm doing great in it. Income is good. I could support this house, and then you say, well, we'll co-sign for you. you know, there, there are different ways that you could access those funds now. Um, there are also more you know, different types of programs, bank statement programs. That, that, I'm generally not going to recommend that for you. I think patience is better than, than just kind of forcing the issue, but there are bank statement programs where they take a year's worth of history of, of just your bank deposits and say, okay, we see you've got this year's worth of history of bank deposits, and we will basically count that as income. It, it would probably be better for you just to be patient, um, to educate you about the market, yeah. to continue to invest in your career and grow that commission. What I'll do, what I recommend is rather than just take an abstract number, you know, like uh, let's say I want to buy 700000 and take an abstract house, it's just go poke around, you know, on Zillow or, or wherever you like to look, whatever app you like to use to look at properties, and find a property that that's somewhere in that price range. It doesn't even have to be one that's for sale now, it can be already sold or pending, but just something that's somewhat representative of a property that you might be interested in. And then we can okay. grab real county yeah. taxes and I can run real numbers for you and kind of show you, okay, here's, you know, here's where you would be, uh, yeah. you know, based upon putting 10% down, 700,000. And we can even then start to talk about, here's the kind of income you'd have to earn, you know, in, in, yeah. order, in order to qualify that. Here's what your year has to look like in order to qualify for that. Um, so I, I think that would be super helpful to do.